Yes, Mr. Bertel. May I please your Lordship, when the call rose yesterday evening, I was addressing you in relation to the question of desire to prefer. Yes. Before I continue with that, I'd like, however, if I may, to pick up on three points that arose out of exchanges between the court and either Mr. Smith yes. or I during the course of yesterday. The first arises out of an exchange between Her Ladyship and Mr. Smith. And during the course of Mr. Smith's submissions, at one point, my lady asked him whether Mr. Enoch had his actual or ostensible authority to make decisions about payment on behalf of the Comet when the SPA was signed. Mr. Smith's response to that, I'm quoting off the transcript, was, quote, there would have been a potential question in relation to that. In the event, it was never ventilated at trial. He was one of five directors. And in my submission to the court, that is um, flat wrong. And it misrepresents an important aspect of the judge's analysis. Um, may I start my submissions of this off? By taking the court to an authority I said I wasn't going to take the court to, which is in volume one of the authorities bundle at tab three. It's a case called Drabble Brothers, and the reason I do it is because it will help the court to set in context and understand exactly what this aspect of the judge's reasoning was. On the facts of this case, this was a case under the Bankruptcy Act 1914, the predecessor provision to section 239 being section 24. On the facts, Drabble Brothers were from builders. They went into insolvency. They had paid various builders merchants by cheque in the run-up to winding up. The liquidator brought a preference claim in relation to those cheque payments. The cheques had been signed by one of the Drabble Brothers, and there was no suggestion that that Drabble Brother had any intention to prefer any of the people in respect of whom the liquidator made claims. But the Drabbles had an intermediary called Tiley in between them and the builders' merchant suppliers. And Tiley faced both ways. He was an agent of Drabble Brothers, but he also had relationships with the suppliers which gave him a commission, and that commission was dependent upon the amount those suppliers got paid. The evidence showed that Drabble signed the checks Tiley put in front of him saying needed to be signed for the ongoing building projects, but that Tiley singled out for payment the suppliers with whom he had commission to maximize his own take. So that raised the question of principle. When Drabble had made the payments that did not have what we would now term desire to prefer, but Tiley did, did a preference claim lie. There was a hearing in the county court at which the liquidator won. There was an initial appeal to the divisional court in which the liquidator lost. The county court decision was overturned. And I'm not going to read you any extended extracts of it, but if you turn on to bundle page 40, number at the bottom right-hand side, Forgive me, not bundle page 40, bundle page 29. You're in one of the two speeches in the divisional court. It's Mr. Justice Farwell. And you can see that the, the punchline is just by the second hole punch, where he says, if the person who makes the payment had no such intention at all, the state of mind of some other person, be he the agent, the employer, or some other person may in some way have induced the signing of the check, is, in my judgment, wholly irrelevant. And that was the critical point, and the Court of Appeal disagreed on that. And if I take you on now to bundle page 40, you can get this point out of all three speeches in the Court of Appeal, but it appears most crisply in the decision of Lord Hanworth, then Master of the Rolls. About 10 lines up from the bottom of bundle page 40, he says, when F. Drabble undertook to sign any cheque that was put before him for any amount and to any person which should be chosen and determined by Tiley, he so far delegated his authority as to make the act and intention and the knowledge of Tiley his own, because Tiley, on those details of the finance, represented, it, represented his principle and thus made his, Tiley's intention, the intentions of the principle. So that decision turned foursquare on an agency analysis. 
And if you now put that decision away and take up the judgment of Mrs. Justice Hopp back in the core bundle of tab six. Starting it off on bundle page 160 in tab six. Sorry, 100 and? 160. Tab six, page 160. And I'm looking at paragraph 235 by the second hole punch. And the learned judge has had a has had a number of paragraphs discussing the decision in Drabble, and you see the, the authority which she thinks that decision is that, that that case is authority for in the first sentence of 235. In my view, Drabble is authority for the proposition that a desire to prefer held by an employee or agent of the debtor, acting in their capacity as such, may be attributed to their principal, where that desire influences the relevant decision. It, is not, it does not support a proposition that desires of an individual can be attributed to a company simply because they happen to be an agent or employee if they are not acting in that capacity. This was relevant because Mr. Enoch was, of course, a director of Comet at the time the SBA was signed. So we're two other individuals who are material I'm going to come on to in a moment. And in the judge's reasoning, this raised the question of whether when Mr. Enoch did what he did do in executing the SPA, assuming that he was wearing a Comet hat, whether he was acting in a relevant capacity. It wasn't enough simply to determine that he was an agent, that he was acting in a relevant capacity. And that is the point which the learned judge then addresses if you turn on to bundle page 161. And I'm going to look with you at the paragraph starting at the bottom of that page, paragraph 242. But just before I do, I just want to remind you that there were five Comet directors mm -hmm. pre-completion, and they divided into two camps. In one camp, there were three individuals who were also directors or officers of Kieser or Kieser Group entities. Mr. Enoch, general counsel of Kieser, Mr. Platt, He's as chief financial officer, and Mr. Falk Pierrotin, who was in fact um, Keyes's board chairman. There were then two, and only two other directors. Sorry, Enoch. Enoch was general counsel. He was general counsel, and he was company secretary, I think, for some of the Keyes's companies. Yes. His only directorship was that of Comet. Um, he that. was also a director of. Um, the pension trustee company, yes. CTCL, and that is relevant for a purpose I'm going to come back to. But your lordship is absolutely right. He wasn't a director of Kisa, but he was company secretary, and he had a role as group counsel to the Kisa group. Yeah. Mr. Falk Pierrotin was the chairman of the Kisa board, mm. and Mr. Platt was the CFO of Kisa. I mean, group counsel doesn't take you very far, does it? Because you wouldn't expect counsel whether a group or not, to be a decision maker, maybe an advisor. Well, that's a point which her ladyship specifically addresses, and I'm going to come back to that in a moment, because there was a suggestion made to her at one point, in fact, in closing submission, that she should regard Mr. Enoch as effectively being in a non-executive Yes. Role, and she rejected that, but I'll come back. And I think that was to do with his directorship yeah. in Comet. Yes. Comet. That's right. The point I want to get to for the moment is that of those five directors, there was that, there was that majority of three with crossover roles within the Keys Group, including, importantly, Mr. Enoch with a role in both Keys and Kill. There were then two others. There was a gentleman called Mr. Terrier, who figured virtually not at all anywhere in the 30-odd volumes of the trial papers. And the only other one was Mr. Dark. Mm. And the judge found, as a fact, that he was, I quote, positively excluded, quote unquote, from the transaction. Yeah. That's paragraph 251, bundle page 164. Well, so in, her main conclusion is in 244, isn't it? I'm sorry? Her main conclusion is in 244. Isn't yes. It? They were, the, the majority of the board were content, either consciously or by leaving a detail to Enoch, to enter into a transaction which contemplated comment taking action, blah, blah. That, that's that's well it, yes that's two four two starting at the, and two four four as well but it's yeah. starting it's starting at two four two where she says that the five directors Enoch and Platt were heavily involved in the process of agreeing the terms 
clear from the evidence, the other comic director who also had a kept role, Mr. Falkier returned was content to leave the details to them. As between Platt and Enoch, it was Enoch who dealt with the documentary detail. <coughs> Terrier appears to have had no material <coughs> involvement. The fifth director, Dark, clearly had a real interest as part of the proposed new board, but he was not involved in agreeing the terms and didn't even see it before it was signed. <coughs> so the submission that I put to the judge below was that the old board effectively made a decision about who the new board was going to, at the very least, be asked to pay at completion, and that the old board, the majority in the old board, given their crossover roles, unsurprisingly decided that the answer to that should be killed. And in this passage, her ladyship holds that Mr. Falk Kiritan and Mr. Platt simply left it to Mr. Enoch to pay for the transaction for the cheaper. And for the purposes of understanding her ladyship's judgment, can I just yes. pause a moment? If I misunderstood what you said correctly, you, you said, I think, that the old board made a decision about what Comet would be asked to pay on completion. That is not the same as saying Comet had decided to pay on completion. Um, the old board has made a decision. The old board has made a decision. That the submission that I put to the judge, and forgive me if I've paraphrased it inelegantly, the old, board, the old board has effectively decided that the Comet is going to pay, subject to the new board ratifying that decision upon appointment. So it is, as I submitted yesterday, a conditional decision. And as I'm coming on to you, the new board's room for manoeuvre within the transactional parameters which were set up by the old board were negligible to zero, for reasons that I'm going to come on to. When you say the old board, do you mean the members of the old board, or do you mean the old board acting as itself? Um, so, in 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 the in the um, the majority of the old board, I accept that there's no formal board resolution to that effect. But the the, the 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 basis for her ladyship's finding below is that the three keys of members of the old board effectively had a view about what was going to be done, and left Mr. Enoch to document. And that, that's why the next thing that I was going to show the court, if you just, turn... Just before sorry, you do, 244 you would have taken to be. Yes. Individuals comprising the majority of the Comets board um, were content to enter into a transaction which contemplated Comet taking certain actions. Well, that's obvious, because uh, certainly Mr. Falk, Puritan and Mr. Platt were directors of Kieser, and they went along with the SPA under which it was contemplated that Comet would do certain things. Yes. But that doesn't tell you that they were doing anything on behalf of Comet. So just as to Mr. Platt and, well, thinking about the, the people who were directors of Comet at the time, there's Mr. Platt, there's Mr. Dark, there's Mr. Falk Puritan and Mr. Terrier. Um, Mr. Falk Puritan and Mr. Platt, at least, were closely involved in all this. And Mr. Platt gave evidence, as indeed did Mr. Dark. Um, so was it suggested to Mr. Platt that he knew that a comet had made a decision at the time of the SPA? Um, I, can't, I, can't give a, I can't give an answer to that question as I stand here. I haven't specifically reread Mr. Platt's cross-examination, which isn't in the appeal bundle with a purpose to ask him that. Well, I think the point that Mr. Smith was making yesterday was it wasn't explored in evidence. Well, I mean, we can see what the judge decided, but he said, well, I'm, I'm I mean, his whole, the th whole thrust of his argument is there is no evidence to support the judge's I'm, finding. I'm, 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 com I'm coming to that right. in a moment, if I may. Yeah. But, but, but Just that, 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 sorry. sorry, go on. No, I've got to answer my Lord's point before um, moving on. Well, I, I think I have. I mean, I, I, I am absolutely coming to exactly that point. Because I, I repeat the submission that what the court was concerned with below and what this court is concerned with on appeal is an appeal from an inferential finding. Mm. And I showed the court yesterday decisions by Mr. Justice Lloyd, Mr. Justice David Richards, making good the proposition that to establish a decision, quote unquote, by a company, it is unnecessary to point to some board resolution taken by that company 
It is an inferential finding of fact. And the question before this court is whether there is any basis upon which her ladyship below could have taken that decision. I am going to come back to that. But uh, unless Lord yeah. Justice New wants to... Yes. The, the, the case, your case, which the judge accepted, was that Mr Enoch made a decision on behalf of Comet at the time of the SPA. Yes. So one might reasonably ask then, well, were um, other directors, either present directors or future directors of uh, Comet, told of this decision? Is there any evidence that any of them was? Um, so the evidence that the judge bases herself on is that, well, that perhaps the answer to that is the one that I'm just about to come on to if I take the court back to bundle page 153. Paragraph 201. The, the discussion in this section of the judge's judgment is primarily framed by reference to Mr. Enoch. But the starting point for it at paragraph 201, the liquidator's primary case relies on an alleged desire on the part of KHL, Kepkill, and Mr. Enoch. It's, con it's convenient to consider that first. For these purposes, I see no relevant distinction. So the, the point that the judge is making is effectively that the Akiza office holders formed collectively a view in relation to the desirability of the repayment of kill and left the mechanics of that and the execution and the implement implementation of it to Mr. Enoch. And I am going to come back to the question that I addressed to yes. Mr. Enoch about that in cross. Just specifically as to the question, is the answer then no? There is no evidence that any other director of Comet, either at the time of, in November or the new board, knew of a decision taken by Comet at the time of the SPA? Well, they certainly... Um, so, if, 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 so the, the other relevant director would have been Mr. Platt, and it is crystal clear that Mr. Platt knew of the terms of the SPA. Was he specifically asked, have you taken a decision on the part of Comet? I'm almost certain that the answer to that question is no, but I haven't recently reread the transcript. I mean, clearly they all knew about the terms of yes. the SPA, but the SPA contemplated a future decision yeah. and Comet wasn't a party to the SPA. So did any, is there any evidence that any other director, either present or future, knew of a decision by Comet at the time of the SPA uh, 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 such as the judge envisages? Uh, as I've indicated, I think the, the answer is I've, I've put it to Mr Enoch. I'm going to come back to that. I don't believe I put that to Mr. Platt, and they were the only two relevant witnesses in that regard. And, and come back to this, but I have now read Mr. Enoch's cross-examination. I don't think it was put to Mr. Enoch that Comet made a decision at the yeah. time of the SPA. Um, my Lord, I think that may be right, but that question is a question for the judge to form an inferential view of on the totality of the evidence. Why? Why don't you ask the person who said to have made the decision? Well, I, I, I certainly put it to Mr. Enoch that the consequence of what happened was that the new board upon appointment was effectively locked in. Let me, let, 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 let me come on to the points which I rely on, and perhaps... Sorry, just before, just before we move yes. on, Mr. Becker, you, you've shown us paragraph 201, the judge's judgment. Yes. There the judge says that she sees no relevant distinction between... K H L K E P Killer, Mr. Enoch. She doesn't mention Comet in that no. particular paragraph. No. So what's the point you're getting out of paragraph 201? The, 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 point, that, the, the point that I'm making is that the relevant desire was a desire on the part of the Kieser parties, which for this, for this purpose included the three members of the board. And the Comet? Board. Or not and Comet? Um, well, it's not what the judge says there. No, exactly. I have to accept that. I have to accept that. The second point I wanted to sweep up from yesterday, um, from the exchanges yesterday, I had a discussion with my Lord Lord Justice Newey yesterday about why it mattered that Kill was repaid at completion. And I made the point that apart from the fact that real cash moved, 
One of the key reasons why that mattered was that if that had not been done, Giza would have had to pay a significantly larger dowry to Ocapita in order to take Comet off its hands. And I promised to give the court some references within the judgment for that. In tab six in the judgment, starting it at page 114, The first thing to show you is paragraph 20, which I paraphrased in submissions yesterday but didn't read you. This is talking about Ocapita's second round bid. This is talking about the second round bids from both Ocapita and Valco. And it's specifically the last sentence that I um, foreshadowed yesterday. Valco, so that's the unsuccessful party. Valco's bid also envisaged nominal consideration but it required a £145 million pound dowry or alternatively a joint venture. So the reason Giza didn't go with Balco was because it would have had to have put its hand in its pocket on one of these two alternatives <coughs> and give them £145 million. Pound. But then if you move on to bundle page 121, I also made the point looking at paragraph 48 at the bottom of that page, that although the dowry that passed to Op Capital was ostensibly only 36 million pounds, it was in fact 151 million pounds, because not only did they get the dowry, but they got a charge without expending money for 115 million pounds over Comet's assets. And when you add the 36 million and the 115, you get to the 151 figure. Pretty close, as you will note, to the 145, which Valco suggested. But with this important difference, that on the Valco proposal, that is 145 million pounds in cash that Kisa would actually have had to part with. On the mechanics of this transaction, Kisa parts with 36 million pounds in cash. And the balance of the 115.4 is financed by the circular funds flow at completion, which turns on the discharge of Kill RCF. So effectively, what Kisa has done is to secure a dowry payment not dissimilar to the one that Dr. Valco asked for, but financing that at the expense of Comet's unsecured creditors. And if the court turns on to bundle page 155, and we look at paragraph 210, the judge makes precisely uh, that point. We've already looked twice, I think, at paragraph 209. That's the paragraph about the alternative options, either a capitalization or assignment. And at 2.10, her ladyship says that isn't what was done. If it had been, then the presentation to credit insurers would have looked different, in particular the structure chart depicting £80 million being injected into Comet by the purchasing vehicle as an RCF would have been manifestly incorrect. The structure chart necessarily involved repayment of the kill RCF. Without the language of Lord Justice Legate, that the payment was not something Kiesa would have wished to avoid or had no wish to bring about. Rather, given the economics, I must infer that it is something that Kiesa desired. Otherwise, using the figures in the structure chart, it would have been left with a net payment by it of £80 million rather than the much lower, lower dowry that it intended to pay. So, I just said one thing. I don't think this really matters in this context, but uh, plainly, once you've adopted the sort of structure that was ultimately adopted. You have to have a repayment of kill, otherwise Easter is paying out much more than it is spent. Um, we also see the judge pointing out that there are other ways of doing this. And having read Mr. Enoch's evidence, I see that you put it to him that there are other ways of doing this, and he says, well, I suppose so. Um, I'm not sure you ever put to him that Kisa that adopted this method in order to improve Kill's position in insolvency. Let me come back in a moment to the passages where I suggest that I did or came as close as is necessary to 
There we go. I, I am going to squarely address that. Before resuming the submissions I was making yesterday afternoon, I said there were three points I wanted to make. Those are the first two. The third one just picks up on an exchange I had with Her Ladyship, where Her Ladyship recalled there being a passage in the judgment which had discussed, I'm paraphrasing, the fact that Op Capita and Keyes' interests were in lockstep. And that passage is, in fact, the passage that you see further down this page at paragraph 213. And I'm not going to read it out. It's a little bit involved because it's a commentary on a meeting, which is not very digestible, simply extracted as a bleeding chunk. But if you turn over to page 156 and look at the concluding four or five lines, you'll see that in a nutshell what happened was there came a point at which Op Capita realised that Comet owed Kill a substantially larger debt than it initially appreciated and reacted to that as very good news. And her ladyship explains why. And in the concluding two sentences it says, so it allowed both parties' objectives to be achieved, and indeed in Op Capita's case, with an additional bonus of extra security for no concomitant exposure. I'm not surprised that Mr. Spurry became animated. So that was the answer to your ladyship's question. Thank you. So having dealt with those points, I'm now coming back to the question of desire to prefer. And I um, at the moment, on the first question, which is the question about date for the decision, I've taken the court through some decisions yesterday and I've made some submissions by reference to them. And if I may, I'm going to structure what I say initially by reference to the submissions in Darty's skeleton argument. And if you have that, I'm going to pick it up, if I may, at paragraph 28. So this is all under what Darty is calling round one. Comet didn't decide to repay Kill on the 9th of November. And the first point that's made by Darty is that Comet wasn't a party to the SPA. And I, of course, accept that that is correct, but I say it's not the point. The point is not, was the SPA a decision by Comet to repay Kill? The point below was, did the SPA and its terms evidence a decision to do so having been taken, even if only a conditional one in the form that I expressed a moment ago, i.e. Comet is going to repay subject to the passing of a formal resolution to that effect at completion. And so far as isn't her ladyship... Isn't it a bit more conditional than that? It's conditional on, amongst other things, shareholder approval. My, my, my lord, absolutely right. I mean, I, I'm, I'm, I'm ignoring the conditions precedent in the transaction of shareholder approval, yeah. pensions regulator approval. I think there was also a conditional relating to approval by Curacao regulator. So plainly it is a conditional decision. But if anything, I, I suggest it only amplifies the point that one can take a commercial decision Mm. which is dependent for efficacy on various things that you assume is going to happen afterwards. And our submission to the trial judge was that the assumption in relation to what the new board was going to do was an assumption of the same order as the conditions precedent you see expressed in Schedule 1. Yeah. Going to how her ladyship dealt with this, back in the cool bundle at tab 6, the relevant passage is paragraph 62 to 63, which you find at bundle page 124. And I'm going to start by showing you these two paragraphs to make a, an important point. Given that what the court was dealing with here below was an inferential finding, that the evidential material in front of the court was, to use a neutral term, very significantly compromised. 
And that's the point which her ladyship is addressing here, where she says at 62, as might be expected for a trial of this nature, the documentary evidence was extensive. But there was a potentially material limitation at transpired. Sorry, 52, 62 on page 124. I think it was. Maybe my mistake. Paragraph 62 on page 124. As might be, extent, might be expected, the documentary evidence was relatively extended. However, there was a potentially material limitation that transpired that following the acquisition of KEP, in 2016, the emails of UK employees of Kiza had been deleted without a backup. This was considered at a CMC before George Bumpus, Queen's Counsel, sitting as a deputy judge. He expressed some reservations about the explanations that had been provided for trying to make an order that the liquidator requested, requiring a comprehensive account of the document deletion. And then over the page, at paragraph 63, so just before I take you to this, the evidence before the judge was that the deal on the sell side was driven by a three-man deal team comprising Mr. Platt, Mr. Enoch, and a man called Mr. Stoogley. And at Paris 63, her ladyship says the result of the deletion is that relatively few emails between the core deal team of Mr. Enoch, Platt, and Keyes' director of corporate finance, Andrew Stoogley, survive. Those that do are generally ones that were also sent to or included within a chain sent to Keyes' solicitor, Slaughter's. I should clarify that privilege was not waived in Slaughter's advice. And I'm not going to take up time taking you to the underlying decision of the deputy judge, but just to give you the reference, it's actually in the authorities bundle, volume four, at tab 30. And the finding that the deputy judge made was that there was no adequately sufficient explanation for what had been lost and why it had been lost. So the position before her ladyship at trial was that in July 2016, note less than six years after the transaction date, Giza had deleted a large amount of potentially relevant material, including emails between the three-man deal team. And there was never any adequate explanation for that. So the contemporaneous record against which the judge was invited to draw her inferences was, to that extent, significantly compromised. But there were nevertheless, we say, a number of features which pointed to the conclusion that a decision was taken by Mr. Enoch and the other Kiesa members of the old board to re repay Kill either at or prior to the execution of the SPA. First was that as the judge found, and as was indeed common ground, Mr. Enoch, quote, took the leading role, unquote, in negotiating the deal. He was its primary architect on the sell side. Paragraph 66 of the judgment. Secondly, at all material times until the completion meeting, Mr. Enoch was a comic director. And as the judge found, he was wearing his comic hat in relation to these events, and that was a critical finding. Um, what does that mean? I mean, he wasn't wearing his comet hat when he signed the SPA. No. So when was he wearing his comet hat? Um, the finding that her ladyship makes is that he was wearing his comet hat throughout. And hat wearing is a rather inapposite analogy for this purpose, because one can be wearing more than one hat at the same time. But he can't um, be wearing his comet hat when he signed the SPA. Um, he wasn't wearing his Comet hat when he executed the SPA because, of course, Comet wasn't a party to the SPA. But the finding of fact that her ladyship makes is that, save for that point, to which she, in fact, expressly refers, he was wearing a Comet hat, even if he may have been wearing other hats as well. And I am going to come back in detail to that point separately. But as I mentioned in my opening comments yesterday afternoon, all of these factors are cumulative and fall to be regarded holistically. It's, uh, we respectfully suggest, erroneous to fill it out an individual one and to say, well, that doesn't found an inference, that one doesn't found an inference, that one doesn't found an inference. The question is whether the totality of the picture upon which the trial judge relies does warrant the inference which she drew. So that was the second point. The third point, importantly, was that Mr. Enoch gave an entirely inaccurate account 
of how the repayment of the kill RCF had ended up as part of the share purchase agreement. His evidence was that it had been imposed on PISA by Op Capita's solicitors McFarlane. But having seen him cross-examined for something over a day, the judge disbelieved that evidence on that critical point and concluded that it was something which Kieser actively wanted to bring about. I'm going to come back to the detail of that separately as well. Fourthly, by means of the SPA, Mr. Enoch, with the acquiescence of the other majority members of the Comet Board, brought into being an elaborate transactional structure in which the repayment of kill by Comet at completion was a fundamental fact. It was effectively baked in. And the references <coughs> for some of the material provisions, I won't take you back to them, are in paragraph 41 of Her Ladyship's judgment. But the key point, there are others as well, but the key point is that that trio of provisions, all of which say, and Comet shall agree to repay. Can I just understand that again? The, we, we know your position on Mr. Enoch. You've referred to other members of the Comet board who were involved at this stage, or in particular Mr. Platt, obviously, since he was part of the, the key team. Um, and supposing that the missing emails had revealed a decision by Comet, presumably he'd have known about it. Um, uh, so, take it by stages, was it ever suggested either uh, to Mr. Platt when he gave evidence, or as part of your case, that Mr. Platt had known of a decision by Comet, or indeed been involved in the decision by Comet, at the stage of the SPA? We, we, we can check that. The answer as I stand here is, I, I don't recall that it was, but Mr. Platt's cross-examination hasn't gone into the bundle. I haven't reread it since the trial. And leave aside the cross examination, though, was it part of your case that Mr. Platt was party to such a decision? Um, I think to answer that, we need to look at the um, amended reply rather than me trying to remember what the pleaded case was. And you find that in the supplemental bundle, volume one of that bundle, tab one, with the relevant passage being on bundle page 8. So do you see um, Roman 2 and Roman 3 in the middle of the page? And you can see that there are some purple amendments to that. Those purple amendments are the amendments that were made in the course of the trial itself. And Darcy Skeleton has explained to the court how that came about. So the black is the original pleaded case. And um, the straight answer to your lordship's question is it doesn't specifically instance Mr. Platt in that. I mean, to the contrary, it says it was taken on behalf of Comet by Mr. Elon. Yes. So I've made the point that by means of the SPA, Comet was locked into an elaborate transactional structure in which the repayment of kill was a fundamental part. That was my fourth point. And my fifth point is that after the date of the SPA, her ladyship found at trial that Comet was, for all practical purposes, locked in by what she termed in paragraph 274 of the judgment the, quote, careful choreography, unquote, of the transaction. Now, I accept, as my ladyship, Lady Justice Lang, put to Mr. Smith yesterday, that an anticipation that something will be done by A's anticipation, that something will be done by B, does not necessarily of itself warrant an inference that B has taken a decision to do that. But I reiterate point does not stand alone. Yeah. Well, what do we make of the record in the board minutes of the 3rd of February 
that approaches have been made to, amongst others, HBC and Barclays for alternative finance. How does that square with the finding that Comet were locked in? Um, well, um, it doesn't undermine the point because in the event that there had been uh, an alternative provision of finance by a different lender, the entire basis of the mechanism contemplated <coughs> in the share purchase agreement and the completion agreement would have fallen away. If Kill had been refinanced... Well, exactly. So yes. why is it... Why do you say that Comet had made a decision, had made a decision, to enter into this transaction when they appear to have been exploring alternative sources of finance? Because the reality was that there were no alternative sources of finance to well, a company. Does the judge find that that was a sham, that they didn't make those approaches? My Lord Admiral, I, I don't think the judge made any no. such finding. No, absolutely. And as I understood it, the accuracy of the board minutes is not challenged. No, that's absolutely the case. Don't for one moment dispute that anything said in the board minutes is incorrect. Just following that up a moment, there's no suggestion, is there, that the new board knew anything? of a decision taken in November? No. And so the decision would have been a pointless one because it was never going to affect what Comet did in the future because no one knew about it. But they knew that they were presented with a transaction in which the repayment of Kill was a component part. So they knew that the parent had created a structure that put them in that position. There's no reason to believe that they knew that anything had been said on behalf of Comet to that effect. I don't think there was any evidence about whether they directed their mind to who had created that situation. But you, 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 yeah. But your lordship is right. That there's no express discussion of that in the judgment. Well, there was no evidence. Can I show you the passages within the judgment that I was going to take you to in relation to this point of the board's freedom for manoeuvre by the time it got to the transaction date, completion date on the 3rd of February? Well, just a minute, that's a different point, a different point in time. There may have been very little room for manoeuvre by the 3rd of February, not least because attempts to find alternative sources of finance had failed. But that doesn't show that on the 9th of November the decision had been made. Um, my, my Lord, I accept that. But the first point, which I was going to show you at bundle page 163. One. At bundle page 163, looking at paragraph 247. One of the first points that I put to Mr. Dunn was transaction was only going to proceed at all in the event that there was a class one shareholder resolution. By the time there had been a class one shareholder resolution, to put it to him effectively, it would have been a PR disaster if the board at that point had said, well, we're not going to do this deal. And that's the submission which her ladyship accept, accepts there. Reading paragraph 247, I agree with Mr. Dark's assessment. He says, just in the line above, Following cap shareholder approval being obtained, a sale was inevitable. I agree with Mr. Dark's assessment. By the time it got to 3 February, the new board's hands were tied. It was theoretically open to them to refuse to pass the necessary formal resolution. But in reality, it would have been extremely difficult to do so, and they would have been sacked and replaced. And the judge adverts to that possibility at a number of different junctures, and that was a finding of fact that she made. I follow that, but there's no reason to suppose, is there, that the board perceived their hands as being tied as a result of some earlier decision made on Comet's behalf. I, 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 I have to accept that it wasn't explored with Mr. Dark, Mr. Clare, who were the two new board directors who gave evidence, whether they believed that Comet itself had taken some prior decision. And it wasn't explored with Mr. Goldring either. 
I don't believe it was, no, but I didn't cross-examine Mr Goldring, so that would be a question of what his proof said. Well, Mr Goldring, according to the judge, got the impression that Comet was being expected to comply with the wishes of other transaction parties. That's what she says at 2.50. Yes. Not that he was told that there had been a decision. To Certainly. Do. I accept that. Paragraph 248 is a passage that I've already shown you and which I've just adverted to, which is the difficulty of the new board reversing out of the transaction in the light of the class one approval and the judge's observation as to the unusual fact that the new board were appointed to take this decision even in advance of completion. So before the shares had moved to the purchaser. And then over the page at paragraph 256, you get to the judge's conclusion about what I said a moment ago, that the preference is baked in. The conclusion that a decision was taken on behalf of Comet at the time that the SPA was entered into does not dispose of the issue of desire to prefer in the liquidator's favor. It's undeniable that at least formally the board itself took decisions, albeit in reality that it was a binary decision. As Mr. Dark explained over the page, the repayment of a loan to kill was wrapped up in the deal and we were not in a position to unpick it. And so his evidence, which was accepted by the judge, was that he was effectively faced with a binary choice. And I accept that there are references in the board minute to approaches to third party lenders, but that is the conclusion which Mr. Dark arrived at and which the judge accepted. And then it's important to continue by understanding one of the key features in the decision landscape confronting the new board when it confronted this binary universe of deal or no deal. And you see that if you look further down the bundle page 165, paragraph 261, where her ladyship quotes from the completion minute in reaching the conclusion the proposal should be approved. Section 21.2 records the new board's reasons as follows. Skipping over the page, see paragraph 21.2.5, just above the first hole punch. The only alternative, so this is the board's conclusion, the new board's conclusion, the only alternative absent a different deal with other investors is an imminent administration, the outcome of which is unlikely to produce a meaningful dividend for unsecured creditors. And then the judge comments on that at 262 and 263. A critical part of this reasoning was flawed. It was not the case that the only alternative was an imminent administration. If the deal didn't proceed, then Pisa's plan B, that's a reference back to paragraph 28 of the judgment, was to continue with the turnaround plan. Pisa would not have readily, note that word, permitted an insolvency process. The wording referring to the only alternative being an imminent administration had derived from one of Mr. Goldring's markups. While it clearly reflected his understanding of the position at the time, he had failed to appreciate that Pisa's actual fallback position was if the disposal was if the disposal did not proceed. In doing so, he had not been actively misled by Pisa, although there are unanswered questions about how the text ended up remaining in a document that must have been seen by Pisa's advisors, and which Mr. Enoch also accepted that he may have read at the completion meeting. So the new board's decision what to do when framed with what I've described as a binary choice was based on a fundamental misunderstanding about what would happen if they did not. And the judge found that Pisa's advisors, and probably Mr. Enoch too, must have been aware of that. But for no reason that Darty was able to advance at trial did nothing to correct it. Sixth, I've made the point in my opening remarks. Sorry, just going back to paragraph 263. Yes. Second part of that paragraph. Judge refers to Mr. Enoch's response on the 1st of February 2022. So that is two days before the board meeting. 
in which he says the board had concluded that off capita was in the best interest of the shareholders, which might suggest that the board had made a decision at least by the 1st of February. I mean, that's the board of KEP or KHL. Oh, I see. Yes. Oh, the KEP board, yes. Ah, oh, sorry. Yeah. Yes, yes, that's further up. Two, two, two different issues. Yes. Is the share disposal in the interests of the kept shareholders? Yes. Is the transaction in the interests of commerce? Yeah. The sixth point is the point that I've already made um, now on two occasions, highlighting the judge's finding that it was unusual for the new board to have been appointed before completion. It's paragraph 248. And I've made the point that this was part of the basis upon which she held that its interposition was part of a strategy to mask the fact that the real decision to repay had been taken beforehand. Seventh, and reflecting that... But why would you need to mark? If the decisions had been taken beforehand by the old board, or on behalf of the old board, why would you need to appoint new directors? Um, because then a preference challenge would have been a straightforward matter. I see. You would have had a majority. That's the whole point of it. So in effect, you, would have had you were saying this was a sham? No, I'm uh, emphatically, with respect, emphatically not saying it was a sham. I'm saying that it is a highly artificial piece of synthetic structuring to mask a decision substantively taken by a majority board with the interests of Keyser in view by popping in a new board at completion who moments later take a decision. Say, I'm sorry. Going, reverting to another point, decision taken by a majority board. Well, I thought it's been taken by Mr. Enoch. So, so my lord's right to pick me up on it. It's the point that I made a moment ago. Mr. Enoch, effectively with the acquiescence of Mr. Paul Pieretta and Mr. Platt, who both left to him the structuring of the transaction. I'm sorry if I didn't express that very well. But, 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 but that, is, that is the fundamental point in answer to Lord Justice Lewis's point. If this decision had been taken, if completion had occurred without a change in the new board occurring, the position would have either been that the decision as to whether or not to repay Kill was left uninstructed to Mr. Terrier and Mr. Dark, with all three of the Keyser directors recusing themselves. And Keyser would have taken their chances or it would have been taken by the majority keys a member vote, in which case there would have been an obvious and clear claim for preference. Mm. And your lordship has seen the passage in the judge's judgment where she says, I think towards the end, I'm afraid I don't recall the paragraph number, structuring did not work. And I made the point to your lordship yesterday afternoon that that is the point that she was driving. Yeah. The seventh point that I wanted to make in relation to the evidential landscape against which the inference was drawn was reflecting the point that I have just made. As the judge also noted, the share purchase agreement was silent as to what would happen if the new board refused to go along with the kill repayment at completion. I understand my learned friend has a reply to that. I'm going to come to that. But I'll just show you, first of all, what the judge said about that. That's her paragraph 239 on bundle page 161. Yes. I've already showed you the last sentence. Given the care usually taken in detailed documentation to cover risks, I infer that the possibility of the new board not falling into line was not considered to be a real risk. And she then goes on at 240 and 241 to point a contrast to two other provisions of the SPA, 240. The position can be contrasted with the conditions to completion identified in the SPA and the provisions in the respect of the ABL facility as to the form of ever specific provisions imposing reasonable endeavours obligations on the relevant parties to ensure fulfilment of the various conditions. Subject it, in the it's case curious, of, though, that when she is setting out the terms of the SPA in paragraphs 41 and 42, <coughs> she moves from clause 18, clause 8 to clause 11 without mentioning clause 9, yes. which is the clause on which Mr. Smith relied. I, I, we checked back, or I didn't check back, my junior checked back overnight to see whether this point about clause 9 
had in fact been raised with the judge in the course of submissions before. And um, our understanding is that it wasn't. So that's why the judge hasn't made that point. But the point that I'm getting to is that actually the point the judge makes here stands because it's a rather different point. So Mr. Smith's point was a point in relation to conditions precedent. And he made the point that in the event of a failure of any of the um, matters stipulated in either Schedule 1 or relevantly Schedule 2, effectively one of the parties had the option to walk away. Yeah. The point that Her Ladyship make, is making here is a rather different one, which is that if you look at the terms of the share purchase agreement, where there are procuring... Where, where there are obligations on Tech to do certain things, at least one of those important obligations is qualified by reference to their need to adhere to director's fiduciary duties. Their need to? Adhere to director's fiduciary duties. That's the point that she's making in Paris 240 and 241. And if I can show you the provision that I'm talking about, it's back in the SPA, which is in the supplemental one book. At volume two, tab 23. Page 302, clause 9.4, was the provision that Mr. Smith talked the court to yesterday. The provision that I'm referring to in which the um, judge below was specifically had in mind is one that you find back on bundle page 289, starting at bundle page 289. So it's within that, it's under the rubric clause 3 of conditions. And you can see 3.4a deals with the class 1 approval that the shareholders are required to give. The parent undertakes to post a circular to shareholders as soon as practical, containing a recommendation from the directors of the parent to its subsidiaries to vote in favour of the resolution. And then the point the judge is getting at is over the page at 290. The obligation of the parent set out in sub 34A is subject to the fiduciary duties from time to time of its directors. So the point her, her ladyship was, was, was getting at at first instance, there wasn't a point made to her about termination in the event that key comment didn't go along with it. The point that she was making is that whereas there is a carve out for the fiduciary duties of the Keyser directors in relation to the recommendations they made to the shareholders, there is no analogous carve out when you get to the provisions in clause eight, which say at three different places, Comet shall agree to repay. They, they don't say that. They say that the parent will procure Comet to repay. Uh, and a shareholder has no fiduciary obligations that could bear on that. So there was no need to insert it. Well, um, the judge also had, um, uh, did in fact deal with the question of the relevance of that procuring obligation. And if I can show your lordship that, that's back in the judgment, so you can put the SPA away again. I mean, I mean just to be clear, that's right, isn't it? That if there's an obligation on the shareholder to procure that the subsidiary does something, there's no need to insert anything about fiduciary obligation. Certainly, cert well, there's certainly no need to insert something in relation to the fiduciary obligations of the procuring shareholder. And the... Uh, subsidiary, on the face of this document, wasn't undertaking any obligation. So there was no need to qualify the obligations of the subsidiary. Well, the, I have to accept Comet is not a party to the shareholders, to, to the SBA, and so Comet doesn't undertake any obligations within the four corners of this document. I have to accept that. But in relation to the procuring obligation, what I was going to show your Lordship... Well, I suppose it could have been drafted as... Um, what, what will be procured is subject to the fiduciary duties of the directors of Comet. Is that the point you're making? And that, yes. That, that isn't there. Yes. But there'd have been no sense in doing that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the, 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 the shareholder was undertaking an unconditional obligation in respect of which it had no 
fiduciary duties. Nothing. The comet wasn't being bound at all by this document. There was no need to say that the directors had to comply with their fiduciary duties because comet was obviously free to make its own decision under the terms of this document in line with the fiduciary duties of the directors at the time. Can I show you, Your Lordship, the passage in relation to the procuring obligation? In the judgment. Back in the judgment. Yes. So, full bundle tab six. Bundle page 161. I've just shown you 239 and 214. Now looking at 241, which starts, in contrast, there was no specific provision covering failure by Comet to do what was expected of it. While it was apparently the case that a failure to repay the kill RCF would have amounted to a breach of Opcapita's procuring obligation, in reality, the manner in which intragroup debts was to be dealt with was prescribed in detail in Clause 8 and required the full participation of both PISA and Opcapita as well as Comet. Clause 8 also required the relevant steps to be taken prior to completion, whereas Clause 7.5 imposed obligations at completion. In practice, it would never actually operate. So, Alain Fred is, is right to say there is a procuring obligation, and he's right to say that that is a material question for the trial judge to address in the context of arriving at an inferential decision of whether a decision has been taken. But it is a point which the trial judge had well in mind and dealt with. The court will remember that when pressed by my Lord Lord Justice Lewison during the course of submissions yesterday morning, Mr. Smith's submission was that there was no material basis, no evidential basis, upon which Mrs. Justice Falk could have drawn the inference she did about an early decision. And the decision and the submission had to be that radical because of the state of the case law, which I'll come back to briefly in a moment. But in the light of the submissions that I've addressed, we submit that that is incorrect. The judge had material before her to support her inference. And as the cases tell us, the question on appeal is emphatically not whether this court would itself have arrived at the same inference on this point. Can I just try this way? The, um, you focus very much on the SPA. So I assume the idea is that it can be inferred from the fact that the parties who entered into the SPA did so, that Comet must have made an agreement, must have made a decision. Um, that, uh, that they wouldn't have entered into this agreement if they hadn't already learned, learned that uh, Comet had decided to go along with this scheme. Now, how does that work if no other director knew of this agreement? Um, so the people subscribing to the SPA didn't know about the decision. And more than that, there was no question of the future board knowing about the decision. So they were never going to be influenced by the decision. So it was always going to be the case that the new board made a decision untrammeled by any previous decision. That being so, how could knowledge of a previous decision, had it existed, have encouraged the parties to enter into the SPA? Uh, because the new board was always going to have a free hand. The, um, I mean, if your lordship casts your mind back to the decision in Drabble. The decision in? Drabble, the case that yes. I showed, that showed the court yep. earlier this morning. So what you have there is a decision taken bona fide by Mr. Drabble when he's presented with a list of people to pay. To pay certain people. He is entirely unaware that from within the community of people that he is paying, a selection has been made by somebody else by reference to considerations that are not proper and legitimate considerations. But at this stage, we're not concerned with motive. We're concerned with the, whether there was a decision. Yes. So we have to work out whether it can be inferred from the fact that the SPA was entered into that 
Comet had made a decision. And from what I suggest is that it doesn't seem to provide any evidence of that. Well, um, as I've indicated, I've indicated the principal grounds upon which I believe her ladyship founded the decision, bar one, which I'm coming on to, which is her decision, which is an important decision, which is that throughout the process, Mr. Enoch was wearing a comet hat. There have been wearing other hats as well, but he was wearing a comet hat. And I, I repeat, without I hope wearying the court, that ultimately the question is whether the evidence viewed holistically as the judge did provided a sufficient warrant for the inferential finding that she made. So is your point, in a way, that once the decision is made on your argument, um, the decision has a, a sort of causal effect of its own and people don't need actually to know about it? Precisely. How did it have a causal effect of its own? It had a causal effect of its own because, um, as I've indicated, a transactional machinery is put in place. That was by the SPA? Yes. Which Comet wasn't a party to. Right. So the decision didn't bear on that. The SPA created that. So how did the decision, how was the decision self-executing? Well, the, 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 the decision was to create a transactional world in which the repayment of kill was an integral component. That was the parents' decision. Um, well, your, your lordship says that. But actually, the finding that the judge makes as a question of fact is that it was a decision that Mr. Enoch arrived at, in part wearing a comet hat. Plainly, he was wearing other hats as well, but he did not distinguish between them. I'll, I will come back to that point about the hat in a moment, if I may. But I just wanted, um, at that point, and before I do that exercise, just to sweep up some points from my learned friend's skeleton argument. Um, so if the court can take that up, The starting point of his discussion of this point is at paragraph 28, where his first point is comet isn't part of the SBA. Yes. I've dealt with that point. The next one over the page um, is that there is a distinction to be drawn looking at his uh, little paragraph two. The question of the likelihood of a post cell board falling into line is a different question. I agree, taken into isolation, it may not show very much, but you have my submission. Yeah. It's not to be regarded in isolation. Over the page is paragraph 29. That's the hat-wearing point that I'm going to come on to. Paragraph 30, where he says that it is obvious that a decision was taken by a comment acting through the post-sale board. And as I, I hope I've made clear, we Except that we do not for one moment, we never have disputed the veracity of the minute. We have never suggested that the board resolution was a sham resolution. The point that we've made is a different one to that. So your, is, point, your point is the board may well have made a decision, did make a decision on the 3rd of February, but it wasn't the relevant decision. Yes. But it was effectively a decision in stages. At the first stage in the SPA, a mechanism is set up where Comet is effectively presented with a choice of who out of the pool of creditors is going to get paid on the 3rd of February. And it then becomes a binary question because it is baked into the deal. And the outcome of the director's conclusion on that is heavily conditioned by a variety of factors, including, as I've indicated, a total misapprehension about what the alternative was, in other words, an imminent administration. So why does that matter? Um, well, it matters because it is, um, to the extent that it's said that it's a real decision, I mean, it is a real decision, but it is a profoundly flawed decision. But as the judge says, a flawed decision yes. is still a decision. I accept that. I accept that. But your, your point, perhaps, is that because the information wasn't accurate, the decision appeared to be starker than it might actually have been. Yes. But that sort of undermines another of your points, because that suggests if the board, the new board, had known the true facts, 
they would have had more freedom of action, and therefore the structure laid down in the SPA wouldn't have determined the outcome. Yes, um, but I reiterate the point that I've made, that that was a misapprehension that the board was under, as the judge finds, to the knowledge of Keyes' advisors, and she possibly Mr. She does find that. I mean, that's well, I don't have a friend. read the material passage out to the court, and the court can make up its own mind about that. I've already made the submission to the court that as Mr. Justice Lloyd's case, um, Wills and Corf Joinery, exemplifies, it is perfectly possible to have a formal decision which is not tainted by desire to refer, but an inferential decision that there has been some other decision which is nevertheless operative and which is, and upon which section 239 sub 5 goes back. And the difference here is simply a difference of sequencing. In wills, the formal decision comes first and the inferential decision is later. Here, the position is the other way around. So where you, I think the way you put this in terms of the Corf joinery case is that on the 8th of November 2011, there is a large number of unsecured creditors, amongst whom is Kill. Yes. By entering into the SPA on the 9th of November, a decision has been taken that of those unsecured creditors, Kill will be the one to be repaid, and um, Powell will acquire a charge in the assets which will remove that, that pot from the unsecured creditors. Yes. That choice between unsecured creditors is a choice that Comet made through the agency of Mr. Enoch, and that is the relevant decision. I know that's precisely so. So, looking back at my learned friend's skeleton argument, there's only one remaining point that I need to address under this limb. If you now look at his paragraph 32, Mr. Smith's primary argument, of course, is there's one decision and one decision only. But he does have an alternative submission if he doesn't succeed in overturning the judge's inferential finding that there were two decisions. And at paragraph 32, he says, even if there were two decisions, reading the fourth line, the decision of the post sale board is the only relevant decision for the purposes of subsection 239A. Now, I promised, threatened, yesterday afternoon to take the court back to Mr. Justice Millett's decision in St. Baker. And if I may now ask you to take that out, that is in tab, it's in volume one of the authorities bundle, and it's at tab six. Mr. Smith took you to some passages in this yesterday. But there's a passage he didn't show you, which is material for the purposes of the submission that we're now on. So turning on to bundle page 71, starting at letter C, there's his lordship's very often cited discussion of the changes brought about by section 239 of the Act. And Mr. Smith showed you the passage at letter H, mm. emphasizing the difference between desire and intention. For my purposes, I want to show you a passage over the page on the principle of the thing first, and then have a little bit of a dive into the facts. So over the page, bundle page 72, just between A and B, his lordship says, no need for there to be direct evidence of the requisite desire. Its existence may be inferred. Then skipping a couple of lines, the mere presence of the requisite desire will not be sufficient by itself. It must have influenced the decision to enter into the transaction. It was submitted on behalf of the bank, but it must have been the factor which, quote, tipped the scales, unquote. I disagree. That is not what sub 5 says. It requires only that the desire should have influenced the decision. That requirement is satisfied if it was one of the factors which operated on the minds of those who made the decision 
it need not have been the only factor or even the decisive one. So um, that's a, a well-known passage. Um, and for the purposes of the case, it's um, useful to go on just to note how that reasoning actually applied to the facts. So I'll summarize those. There were three directors of the company MC Bacon. There was a man called Creel. There was an old man called Glover. And there was Glover's son, who's just called Martin in the judgment. And the preference in question was the granting of a debenture by the company to secure a pre-existing indebtedness. The older Mr. Glover resigned as a director in early April 1987. And just to make that good, if you turn back to bundle page 65, you can get that out of the paragraph you see starting at letter H. On 14 April, the audit <coughs> partner visited the company's offices to discuss completion, although Mr. Glover had retired and no longer had any official position. The decision, which was being attacked by the liquidator in this case, you get if you turn on to page 69. Let us see. On May 19, Martin, so that's the son, returned the bank with a venture which had been sent to him by the bank a few days earlier. Not properly executed because Creel was absent. Martin was the only signatory with the effect appended to in the document re-executed. And then if you turn on to bundle page 73, the judge says, looking at letter A, no evidence that either Martin or Creel wanted to improve the bank's position, and there's no reason why they should. Skipping down a couple of lines, that however is not the end of the matter. They were greatly influenced by Mr. Glover, that's the senior one recommended that the debenture should be granted, and I turn to examine his evidence to see whether he was influenced by a desire to improve the bank's position in the event of a liquidation. Or if he was, then in my judgment, the company's decision was similarly influenced, even though Glover didn't communicate any such desire to the others. And as it happens, Mr. Justice Millett goes on to find that Mr. Glover Sr. didn't have desire to defer, so the claim failed. But the important point is that it was no answer to the claim in MC Bacon of itself that the proximate cause of the grant of the debenture was the decision by the actual directors in executing the debenture. And the point has repeatedly been made in the authorities. Sorry, so how does, how does the judge conclude that it would have been possible for the company's decision to be influenced by a desire which they didn't know about. Because Mr. Glover, on, on the liquidator's case, liquidator was represented That's by... That's a sort of redrabble situation. Yeah. Right? So, so a recommendation by somebody who is influenced, which is then implemented by somebody who doesn't know about that. And you impute the desire, do you? Is that how it works? That's, that's certainly the basis upon which his lordship seems to reason. So they, were, they were influenced by Mr. Glover's wish that it be executed, and Mr. Glover had had the relevant intention. And liquidator was represented by Mr. Voss. So There's quite an elaborate argument about why Mr. Glover Sr. should have had that desire, which is completely immaterial for your purposes. Yes. The point that I'm really getting at is, first of all, the point that the relevant desire doesn't have to fulfill any sort of but-for criteria. It is sufficient that it influences the decision. And that is necessarily so because, as I started to suggest a moment ago, the Insolvency Act cases on insolvency legislation have repeatedly made the point that the clawback provisions of the Act are framed in very wide terms, reflecting the fact that subversions of the statutory insolvency scheme may be both subtle and surreptitious. Do you get that point? So, sorry to interrupt, um, Mr. Bairdford. So is the point you're making that the word
word influence in section 239 subsection 5 includes a causal influence which may not of which the person who's being influenced may not be conscious that's that's certainly what his lordship is saying in that passage mm. in my submission And in effect, they were being influenced by somebody else's desire because they were being influenced by his wish that the thing be done. Yes. And the point that I'm coming on to is that that is an unsurprising conclusion because the authorities tell us that the pullback provisions are framed in wide terms to catch the many and subtle ways in which evasions of the power passive scheme may be brought about. You get that, among other places, from a decision in the bundle, which I'm going to come on to in a different context in a moment, Hill and the Spread Trustee, Lady Justice Arden. And you also get it, I'm not going to take you to it, but a case which we referred to in our skeleton argument called Granada and the Pensions Regulator at tab 29 of the Authorities Bundle, paragraph 126 in particular. And in fact, what that is concerned with, that decision was concerned with, was construing the concept of associateship. Justice Lewison may recall this. It, in fact, overruled the decision of your lordships in a case called Unidare. And one of the points that is made is that the concept of associateship may extend to parties who, in no obvious sense, exert control over the person making the disposition or making the decision. And that reflects a statutory policy to so against that background, it's our submission to the court that there is no warrant for saying that if there is more than one decision in issue here, it is only the formal last one that counts. The statutory test is whether the decision has been influenced by the prohibited desire. And that is ultimately a factual question for the trial judge. And now coming on to the question of what hat Mr. Enoch was wearing, who he was acting for. Just before you do. Yes. Is it suggested that any decision made by Comet in November had any influence on the decision made by the new board in February? We did plead that alternative case. Um, judge did not go on to make a finding in relation to that. We don't have respondents notice in relation to that. I showed you paragraph 3D2 of our reply earlier. There were two paragraphs. One was the one that the judge upheld. The other one was the one that the judge did not deal with because she upheld the first. And we have not filed a respondents notice seeking to uphold a decision on that basis. I'm all right. Can I just widen it? Is it suggested that any decision reached in November had any operative effect at all? Yes, for the reason that Lord Justice Lewison summarised a moment ago. The decision in November effectively confines the pool of people who Comet is being asked to consider to repair completion. But that, on, on, on your case, well, Mr Enoch has that in his mind, but no one else seemingly knows about it. So how can that have affected anything? Because with respect, their knowledge of what is in his mind is not the point. And that is a point that your Lordship gets from Mr Justice Millett's discussion of the facts in MC Baker, where there's no reason to think that either of the two directors know anything about the desire to prefer that Mr Voss alleged to be operative on the mind of Mr Glover Sr. So with the greatest respect, the question of knowledge of Mr Enoch's desire or Mr Enoch's Forget the desire. <laughs> The decision. Is there any reason to believe that the decision had any impact on anything at all? My Lord, yes. <coughs> In our case, yes. Because, because the decision is a decision. Because the decision is effectively a decision to confine the pool of persons, the class of persons who might be repaid at completion. But the other directors never saw it that way. So they, they may not. How, how did the decision affect anything? I mean, they can't, can't on the face of it, have affected anything unless they knew of the. 
they did know of the decision because they were presented with a share purchase agreement which they were asked to sign up to, in which that decision was an integral and a component part. No, it doesn't say anything about a decision by Comet. I accept that it doesn't say anything about a decision by Comet. So there's no reason to believe that anybody who subsequently acted on behalf of Comet knew of a decision taken by Miss Greenock, in which case, how can it, that decision, supposing it had been taken, have had any impact on what happened? Well, I've, I've, I've made the submission to your logic already. It has an impact because it confines the transactional options that are available to the new board who but take this decision. The new board still has to decide. Yes. I mean, no doubt MC Bacon was presented with a debenture in the bank standard form and told, well, either you sign this or we call in the loan. Yes. So it's a take it or leave it deal. You've now got to decide what are you going to do. Are you going to accept the terms on offer or not? Why is that different from what the board were doing, in this case, on the 3rd of February? Here's the deal. There's nothing you can do about it. In fact, they had negotiated some changes to the how RCF, but let's leave that to one side. This is the deal. Um, it's going to be a PR disaster, you say, if you don't accept this. And uh, the only alternative is administration. What are you going to do? It's still a decision to be made, isn't it? I, I accept that. But at that stage of the argument, what the court, what the trial judge is dealing with is the question of whether or not, at this point, there has been a primary decision, mm. whether that decision has been influenced by the relevant state of mind. And at this stage of the argument, the question is whether or not that has been causative. And the trial judge has found, as a matter of fact, that it has been causative. Now, of what? Causative of the decision by the board on the 3rd of February. Oh, you make just show us where she makes that point. Well, I'm afraid yeah, I can't. It's passed me by, I'm afraid. Forgive me. I may have, I'm, I'm paraphrasing what I understand her reasoning to be. I can't show your lordship the precise passage right. in which she says that. Somebody may be able to supply that to me over the short journey. I was moving on to the question of Mr. Enoch and his role. And as I've indicated, in the context of the inferential finding, her ladyship's finding about this specific point was a point of some considerable importance. So until resigning midway through the February 12 completion meeting, Mr. Enoch was a director of Comet, a Comet trustee company, general counsel to the Keyser Group, company secretary of KEP, the listed company at the top, company secretary of Kill, the group treasury company that was actually paying the disabled records. And so we made the point to her ladyship that in relation to the question of whether Comet should repay Kill, Mr. Enoch was at all times in a position of conflict because he was both an officer of the creditor and the debtor. And in those circumstances, there was a debate at trial about what hat he was wearing. And that raised what, on the authorities, is said to be an evaluative question for the trial judge. I won't take the court to it, but the reference is a case called Smithton and Nagar, which you have at tab 22 of the authorities bundle, and it's specifically paragraph 66. Yes. And so this is capacity is a question of fact. Yes. Fact, fact, fact may be, um, well, it's a, it's a slightly protean word. It's an evaluative question. It's not a finding of primary fact. It's not an inference. Mm -hmm. It's an evaluative assessment by the trial judge. It's subject to that, yes. So what was the basis for her ladyship's conclusion that in negotiating the SPA, Enoch was wearing, Mr. Enoch was wearing a comet hat? The first and most important point is the point that I have already made. The old board majority effectively designated the transaction structuring to Mr. Enoch. And there were three other points that I uh, need to draw your attention to. Back in the judgment again, tab six of the core bundle, bundle page 162, paragraph 243. 
witness, Enoch's first witness statement referred to a conflict between his role at Kiser and his role as a director of CTCL, a pension scheme trustee, and explained that as a result he had recused himself from the latter. When asked in Cross how he managed the conflict between his duties to Kieser and his duties to Connick, his response was that he did not perceive there to be a potential conflict. He explained that there never would have been a transaction if Kill had not been repaid. Those were his words and that Kiesa wanted a clean break. And that was a point to which um, significant cross-examination was directed to uh, Mr. Enoch. And that was the foundation for the submission, that in a world where Mr. Enoch had expressly recused himself <coughs> from one role, his CTCL-facing role, but had never even applied his mind to the question of whether he should recuse himself from his separate comic role. But that formed a reasonable basis for the judge arriving at the conclusion that he continued to occupy both of those roles during the currency of the material events. Now, I do want to show the court one specific thing that he said about that in his original witness statement, which you find in the supplemental bundle. First of the supplemental bundles at tab two. <coughs> and turn on to page 21. Because it was more than simply a point of inference and evaluation on the judge's part. So at bundle page 21, you're in Mr. Enoch's first witness statement. Paragraph 22.4, he said, Comet had its own governance structure and was quite independent. My role as a director of Comet principally involved preparing Comet for its sale. During the transaction, my position as a Comet director gave me the ability to take the lead on decisions relating to the sale and free up the executive directors to focus on the turnaround plan, which I described more fully below. So, in part, the submission that Mr. Enoch was acting on behalf of Comet turned on his failure to recuse. In part, it rested on that passage in his evidence. Now, in advance of trial, Mr. Enoch did try to neutralise the force of this point that he was in a position of conflict which he had failed to address. And he did, it in, well, he did it in one way, and in fact, if you stay within that supplemental bundle and turn over to tab three, you have his second witness statement. So within that, if you turn on to bundle page 57, the way that he sought to neutralize this point about conflict, you see at para 4.2, Further, as Mr. Walters highlights at para 14 of his statement, Comet had its own general counsel, Richard Annett, who had been aware of the transaction for months before the parties signed the SBA. I was on good terms with Mr. Annett, and he was an experienced lawyer. I believe that if he had any concerns, he would have raised them with me. I do not recall Mr. Annett doing so. The judge didn't accept that evidence. Well, the judge emphatically rejected it, because we filed a witness statement for Mr. Annett. Mm. I said that not only was that incorrect, yeah. but he had been um, expressly kept away from the transaction. You'll note the implication there, or the tacit admission, that in the run-up to papering the SPA, there might have been a role for a legal advisor to comment, to perform, to consider the structure that was being adopted. That was Mr. Enoch's point. His evidence was that had been done by Mr. Annett, and the judge flatly rejected that evidence. And you have that, I'll just give you the reference. That's paragraph 67 of the judgment. So then at trial, a different attack was pursued on this point of conflict by Darty in closing submissions by asserting to her ladyship that Mr. Enoch was only ever a non-executive director of Comet. But that was a submission which her ladyship rejected as well. 
again, I don't need to take you to it, but that's paragraph 251 yeah. on bonding page 164. So in light of those points, we say it is impossible to say that her ladyship was not entitled to arrive at the evaluative conclusion that she did, that Mr. Enoch was wearing a comet hat throughout. And to the extent Darty's complaint is that Mr. Enoch wasn't cross-examined specifically on that point, there are two short points that I wish to make. The first is that, as I've indicated, I did in fact cross-examine Mr. Enoch at length on the fact that while he had recused himself from his CTCL, the Pension Fund Trustee Directorship, he had never similarly recused himself from his Comet Directorship having regard to the conflict in that situation. And I'll just show you the material passage and invite you to mark it. I won't read it out in full. It's in volume two of the supplemental bundle. Tab 34 is the transcript of Mr. Enoch's cross. And the relevant passage for this purpose starts at bundle page 553. You have bundle page 553, looking at the bottom right-hand quadrant, transcript page 136, line 9. That's where the material passage and cross-examination started. And it ran all the way over on the following page until you get to the bottom of transcript page 140. The, the second point to make in relation to the suggestion of a failure to cross-examine on this point, which as my learned friend accepts, only goes to weight of evidence. There's no point of uh, procedural irregularity. Whereas the point that the judge herself made, if you go back into the judgment and look at her paragraph 252, and that's the bundle page 164, And at power 252, her ladyship said, it's true it wasn't specifically put to Mr. Enoch he was acting for Comet on 9 November when the SPA was signed. I'm prepared to assume that if asked, he would have sought to deny it. However, in my view, it doesn't make a difference to the results. I accord more weight to my assessment of the contemporaneous documents and the commercial realities at the time, together with Mr. Enoch's group line role and his failure to identify any difference of interest between PISA and Comet. And we respectfully suggest that that reasoning is impeccable because the question of what hat Mr. Enoch was wearing throughout was an evaluative one from the trial judge. The, I'm not sure how far this takes things, but the judge says, well, when the SPA was signed, Mr. Enoch was acting for Comet. Um, I think you accepted earlier he wasn't acting for Comet when he actually put his name on the document on behalf of the Certainly. two parents. So one has to look to things he did at that time on behalf of Comet. And it's right, isn't it, that it was not suggested to him in cross-examination that he made a decision on behalf of Comet at the time of the SPA, or indeed at any other time. Um, that is right. The, 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 the basis for the cross-examination in the passage that I've just highlighted to the court was the more wide-ranging one that he failed to differentiate between his roles. And you've seen the express passage in his evidence, which I showed you a moment ago, which expressly refers to him doing things on behalf of Comet in relation to the SPA and its negotiation. But the point that I'm making by reference to this passage of the judgment is a slightly different one. So this question of hat wearing, as I keep calling it, is an evaluative one for the trial judge. Mr. Enoch's subjective perception of who he was acting for, inevitably self-serving, no evidence in particular directed to that in his evidence, is frankly neither here nor there. If I allege negligence against somebody, I'm not obliged to put for them in the witness box that they have been negligent. That is an evaluative conclusion which follows from the other points which I made. But supposing that he 
didn't see himself as acting in a relevant respect to the comet. He couldn't have thought he was making a decision on behalf of the comet. And that's <coughs> not something on which he, his evidence would be irrelevant. He, he must be able to say, look, I thought I was making a decision on behalf of Comet. And if he didn't think he was making a decision on behalf of Comet, then that's the end of it, isn't it? Um, I, I, his subjective perception of who he was acting for, w with respect, I suggest, is not the point. So are you saying that if he didn't think he was making a decision on behalf of Comet, that really doesn't matter because his subjective perception of that is immaterial? His subjective perception is not the point. The point is whether the judge was correct in forming the evaluative conclusion, having regard, in addition to the passage, the expressed passage in his evidence that I've drawn to your attention, that by failing to distinguish between his roles, he was throughout acting in at least that capacity. My submission to the court is that cross-examination, asking him 11 years after the event, where most of the contemporaneous email traffic has gone, where the answer is plainly potentially a self-serving answer, who were you acting for in doing all of this, is unlikely to have been, I respectfully suggest, a very helpful question for her ladyship. Could, I mean, was it not fundamental to ask him whether or not a decision was made? He was certainly, he, he was certainly cross-examined about the fact that decisions, there were things which were contained in the SBA, which were things that Comet was going to have to do. Well, we can see that from the SBA. Yes. As, as I read the cross-examination, and certainly point out to me at some stage if it's wrong, I don't see it ever suggested to him that Comet made a decision at that stage. We'll, we'll consider that over the short adjournment. If your worship's understanding of that is incorrect, I will say. My Lord, I'm now well, moving also, on to... One would also have to ask what decision. Yes. Um, I mean, it's one thing, let us suppose, that Enoch says, I am, what, I have dis what I have decided on behalf of Comet is these are the terms which are going to be put to Comet. That's different from a decision that Comet accepts those terms. So you would need to identify what the decision was. I've already made the submission to your Lordship that the words of the statute don't necessarily postulate a single decision at a single no. moment in time. And in the context of what are intended to be widely framed provisions, it would, in my respectful submission, be an error to say that the statute requires one to identify a decision at a single point in time and no other decision. I've made the point that if you look, for example, at the facts in the Court of Appeals decision in CAF, I accept it wasn't put on this basis, but you can conceptualize the reasoning there on the basis that it was a two-stage decision. If, I don't want to um, stay on this for very long, but um, I don't at the moment remember it being suggested that to Mr. Uh, Enoch in cross-examination that Comet made any decision before February. Um, and that was although your case as opened was that a decision was made by Mr. Enoch in November. We will check, we and, will and, check and the transcript. On the face of it, we don't therefore have the benefit of what Mr. Enoch's response to that would have been, and any discussion by you with him about the scope of any decision. We will check the transcript over the short adjournment, and if we believe there are material passages, we will revert to your lordship on that. Can I move on now to the next topic, which is the question of whether or not Mr. Enoch had desire to prefer? And this raises two subsidiary questions. First, whether there was sufficient material to support the judge's finding to the effect that he did. 
And secondly, whether Darty is right to say that desire to prefer wasn't clearly put to Mr. Enoch, and if so, what follows from that? Starting with the first point, the court has seen from the passage I've shown you with M.C. Bacon that a finding of de desire to prefer can be influential and it almost invariably is absent in admission, and it was here. And so that does take me to the question of what the proper role of this court is on appeal from an inferential finding of fact. I'm going to take this, I hope, reasonably quickly, being acutely conscious of the fact that some of the key decisions in this area are decisions of my Lord and Justice Lewis among others. If you start by taking up Darty's skeleton argument, paragraph 41. proposition put by Darty in writing was that where the finding of a lower court is, as is the case here, based on inferences drawn from primary findings of fact, the appellate court will be in as good a position as the judge below to evaluate what, if any, inferences should be drawn. And there are two cases cited for that um, proposition. Ben Max is one, 50 years before the CPR. And then there's a case called Gatek decided not long afterwards. As the court knows from our skeleton, we take issue with that submission, and it's sufficient for my purposes to show you two short passages which summarize the position in a case that you find in volume four of the authorities bundle at tab 33. This Deutsche Bank. Um, no, this is um, the other one, Kiniston Mainwaring which is the earlier of the two. If we pick it up at bundle page 1090, which is paragraph 16 in the decision of Lord Justice Phillips, and he's quoting there from my Lord Lord Justice Lewis's well-known decision in Phage. I'll read it out. Appellate courts have been reported, repeatedly warned by recent cases at the highest level not to interfere with the findings of fact, fact by trial judges unless compelled. This applies not only to findings of primary fact, but also to the evaluation of those facts and to inferences to be drawn from them. Just before we go on, the Lordship cited um, a, a row of cases, and one of them was a case called Gatek, and I'm going to come back to that because that's the only post-CPR case upon which... Sorry, one, one was which case? Gatek. Gatek, yes. You see at the bottom of 1090. Yes. Yeah. So I'm just going to briefly mention that in a moment. And... The court is very familiar with everything else that follows, but I'll just show you the bottom line that the court comes to in this case in the light of the prior guidance, which you find at bundle page 1094. Looking at paragraph 28, five, six lines up from the bottom, where Lord Justice Stephen <coughs> Phillips says, we're talking here about an inferential finding. On the, on the facts of this case, what was in issue was the reasonableness of an inferential finding made by the first instance judge. And he says, the question, however, is not whether the appellant put forward a plausible or even a preferable reading of the evidence, but whether the appellant demonstrated that the judge was plainly wrong, or put another way, that the decision under appeal is one that no reasonable judge could have arrived at. I think you get it from paragraph 30, sub-paragraph 1. So exactly. Where or Justice Phillips says, I don't see any basis on which the judge can be said to be plainly wrong in inferring. Exactly. And that's how he applies it to the facts. And so our starting proposition is that uh, we, we submit that it is wrong to argue, as the skeleton argument for Darty does, that an appellate court is free to substitute its own view on any finding based on inference. And nor does the only post-CPR authority relied on in the skeleton argument for Darty make good that proposition. And I'll just very quickly talk to that, although my learned friend hasn't dealt with that in his opening submissions. You find that at tab one of the authorities. Tab? Tab one of the authorities. Up the no. Tab one is the Insolvency yes. Act. Yeah. Must be somewhere else. Data. Yeah, Data. Yes. Tab 13. Tab 13. I'm so sorry. File 1. I do apologise. 
This was one of the cases which my Lord Lord Justice Wilson referred to in that summary in Phage. So it would be surprising if it were authority from some very different proposition from the proposition which Lord Justice Phillips drew from Phage, and nor is it any such thing. In very brief compass, what had happened here was that a parcel had been consigned to UPS for international delivery, and it had gone missing. And the key issue at trial was whether it had gone missing because somebody at UPS had stolen it, or whether it had gone missing for some accidental reason. And the trial judge declined to infer theft, principally because he identified two other accidental means by which the consignment could have been lost. But the fundamental flaw with his thinking was that there were the most compelling reasons for thinking that neither of those two accidental explanations were at all likely. And the trial judge had simply failed to address his mind to that point. And you see that if you turn on in the report to bundle page two through four. It's page 1342 of the report. Bundle page 234, which is quoting from the decision of Lord Justice Stephen Richards in the Court of Appeal. And the material bit is between G and H. He, that's the trial judge, made no attempt to analyze the series of steps required for either of those causes, the accidental causes, to have operated. In fact, the cumulative improbability is such that neither cause can be regarded as plausible. The judge failed in this respect to take into account relevant factors. And the Supreme Court effectively sustains the decision on that basis. So this was a case in which, on its facts, the first instance decision cleared the very high hurdle of being rationally insupportable, to quote from one of the cases. And for your lordship's purposes, for the court's purposes, it's important to add, if you turn on to bundle page 240, so that's page 1348 in the report, that one of the reasons the appellate court felt able to intervene in this case was that the trial judge's analysis did not turn to any extent at all on cross-examination. You see that from paragraph 47 on that page. In the present case, the judge's findings of primary fact have not been challenged. Omit a sentence. Essentially, what have been an issue have been the inferences with regard to the causation of loss to be drawn from primary facts, which are not in dispute. And to that extent, in this case, DATEC fundamentally differs from the case before this court. You're concerned with inferences at three stages of analysis. First of all, whether or not there were two decisions or one. Secondly, in relation to what hat Mr. Enoch is wearing, although as I've indicated, that may be more in the nature of an evaluative conclusion than an inference strictly. But thirdly, and most obviously, in relation to the question of whether or not he had desire to preserve. And all three of those conclusions rest to a significant extent on the trial judge's assessment of Mr. Enoch having seen him cross-examined for something over a day. We've given authority um, from the twin sector in our skeleton argument. I can paraphrase, or in fact, I can quote from paragraph 54 of the Deutsche Bank and Sebastian Holdings. I'm not going to take up time taking you to it. Court of Appeal, I quote, will not interfere unless it is clear that something has gone very seriously wrong, quote unquote, where the inferential conclusion depends to a significant extent on cross-examination. So with that preliminary out of the way, how did the trial judge in fact reason her way to the conclusion that Mr. Enoch had desired to defer? To set the scene for that, I need to start, if I may, by taking you back to volume one in the supplemental bundle, tab two, which is Mr. Enoch's witness statement that we looked at for a different purpose a moment ago. And this time we're looking at it for a slightly different purpose. Um, 
Now this statement, just before we move on, looking at page 17, this statement you can see from the front sheet was filed on the 18th of January 2022. And by its date, we had already pleaded that the true decision here was taken, one of our alternative cases was that the true decision here was taken when the SBA was signed and not at completion. And I showed you the paragraph in our reply that did that, and the original of that was filed on the 4th of May, 2020. Now, despite that allegation, <coughs> Mr. Enoch did not give evidence in this witness statement, claiming rather improbably to have remembered exactly what had or had not been present in his mind 11 years earlier, with many of the contemporaneous emails now gone. Instead, he sought to rebut the allegation of desire to prefer in rather more indirect ways, with the cornerstone of what he had to say being what you find if you turn on to bundle page 31. And his answer was, the reason Kill got repaid is because Op Capita imposed that on Kiza. Bundle page 31, para 5.6. On 19 October 2011, Op Capitalist Solicitors McFarlane's provided slaughters with a structure chart to set up mechanics. The structure chart included one repayment of the intercompany loan owed by Kill, Kill RCF. Para 5.7, last sentence. I'm not sure precisely why McFarlane's proposed structure was so complex. I believe it was driven by Op Capitalist tax considerations. 5.8. During these discussions, there was never any debate around the fact that the intercompany debt would be repaid, whatever the structure adopted. Then he goes on, in my experience... Well, the judge recorded all this and didn't accept it. That's correct. All of that was rejected by the trial judge. And as the court has seen, I'm not going to take you back to it, the judge made some adverse findings in relation to the credibility of Mr Enoch's evidence yes. more generally, paragraph 64, paragraph 65... And the material passage for the purposes of this specific point was paragraphs 214 and paragraph 216. And so that was the background against which, key part of the background against which the judge proceeded to infer the relevant desire on the part of Mr Enoch for the four principal following reasons. The first is the point that the court has now seen on a number of occasions in paragraph 209 of her judgment, being that Kiza could have done differently. It could have waived, it could have capitalised, it could have assigned. Instead, and as she said unusually, decided to repay in full. Secondly, in light of that finding, her ladyship at first instance, given her rejection of Mr Enoch's testimony, found as a fact that the repayment of kill was something which Kiza positively desired to achieve. But if you take out the judgment again and turn up bundle page 157, Importantly, she specifically addressed her mind at paragraph 220 to the relevant question. A desire to make a payment is not enough. What is required is a desire to improve Kill's position in the event of an insolvent liquidation. There's a, there's a little bit missing in there. Um, she finds that um, at 211, the repayment of the Kill loan was something that Kiza positively desired to achieve. Then she goes on to ask whether Kiza had the desire to improve Kill's position. Well, we have to be asking, don't we, whether Comet had that desire? Um, yes, I mean, that is correct. The question is as to the desire of Comet. But the discussion is being framed by reference, obviously, to Mr Enoch which is where she locates the desire as being present. In 2.20, I, um, I, mean, I, I accept it doesn't specifically refer to comment. 
but the discussion as it goes on is specifically a discussion as to whether or not Mr Enoch has the relevant state of mind. So that then led into the third question, which is whether Kieser, Mr Enoch, had <coughs> subjectively contemplated the possibility that if the kill RCF were not repaid, kill might suffer a shortfall by reason of Comet's insolvency. And the judge answered that factual question in the affirmative. And there was ample material to justify that conclusion. If I can start it off by taking you back to bundle page 114. She, in fact, deals with this question of anticipation of insolvency in two passages in her judgment. The first is a passage running from paragraphs 19 on, her, on page 114 through to para 22 over the page. And I just want to focus, if I may, with the court on paragraph 19, which refers to a document which you find if you take out the supplemental bundle, volume 1, and turn up tab 14. So this is Supplemental Bundle, Volume 1, Tab 14. This is the judgment, this is the document that her ladyship is talking about in her paragraph 19. You'll see if you have that open that it's dated 29th of August 2011. So this is in between the first round bids going in and the SPA being signed. And it's a document on the Kiesa side of the transaction. And it's headed Op Capita Proposed Solutions. And what this is talking about, to put this into context, is Comet's credit insurers, as I mentioned yesterday afternoon, by this point were becoming jittery, which had significant implications if they withdrew cover for the liquidity requirement of Comet post transaction. And what this paper is addressing is what might be done about those concerns on the part of the credit insurers to try to mitigate that liquidity problem. So you see at the top, Project Keel Op Capita proposed solutions. The proposal, Op Capita has asked if Kiesa could act as buying agent for Comet for a transitionary period of two years. Comet will pay for the product for Kiesa has to. Pros for Kiesa decreases financing requirement for op capita, therefore increasing chance of a comet disposal. Then this, cons for Kiesa. Kiesa becomes comet's largest creditor, which in the event of possible further deterioration in comet's performance, including possible bankruptcy, could leave Kiesa with a significant cash loss, especially if security of inventory has already been provided by asset-backed vendor financing providers. So this document was one part of the basis upon which Mrs. Justice Falk concluded that Kieser had, as a matter of fact, been subjectively concerned about the possibility of loss in a comet insolvency. And if you now go back into the judgment and turn on within that to bundle page 157, There were two parts in her judgment where she discussed this point. This is the second part on bundle page 157, starting at 221. I do not accept that Mr. Enoch and others at Kiesa did not contemplate the possibility of an insolvent liquidation. And she goes on to give a whole series of reasons for that, including the one you see over the page at bundle page 223, bundle page 158 bears reading out. The fact that Kieser had no wish for Comet to go into an insolvency process and indeed was seeking to put in place a capital structure that it received would reduce the risk of that as well as seeking to obtain an assurance from Op Capita does not mean that the possibility of an insolvent liquidation was not in its contemplation. Now, there was a significant amount of evidence in cross-examination for her ladyship to the effect that Kieser regarded an insolvency of Comet 
under its ownership as a deeply undesirable outcome for all sorts of reasons, reputational reasons, reasons to do with its listing, mm. possibly reasons to do with cross -talk. The finding of fact that the judge makes here is that be it accepted that that was, from Keyser's point of view, a highly suboptimal <coughs> outcome, it did, in fact, have that subjective possibility in its mind. And I'm not going to ask you to turn it up, but if you were to look at paragraph 38 of Darty's skeleton argument, Mr. Smith, in fact, read it to you yesterday afternoon. In fact, let's have a look at it. Paragraph 38. Paragraph 38. If you look above paragraph 37, it references some of the findings that the judge made, including last line of paragraph 37, paragraph 221 and 224, which is what I'm on at the moment. Yeah. Paragraph 38, Darty does not challenge the findings of the primary fact referred to above. So that's the third point. And then the fourth and final point in relation to the judge's inference of desire to prefer is the point that the judge finds the chief architect of the deal on the sell side of the transaction to be Mr. Enoch, who is in a conflictual position with duties to both the creditor and the debtor. And I've already shown you paragraph 68 in her ladyship's judgment, where she made a finding that he was concentrating on Keyes's position, and there is no appeal from that finding of fact either. So, subject to the next point that I'm just about to come on to, we respectfully suggest that in light of those findings, that the judge's inference of desire to prefer was quite plainly an inference that was open to her and not one with which this court should interfere on ordinary principles. That point, and this is the second aspect or the second aspect of the substantive question of whether or not Mr. Enoch had desire to prefer, is the one that you saw in Darty's skeleton if you still have paragraph 38 of that open starting at 38 sub 3 yes. where Darcy said... This is the said, point that Mr Smith was majoring on yesterday. Right? Yes. He was saying there are only two scenarios. Scenario one is that Comet stays part of the Keyser group, in which case no insolvent liquidation. Scenario two, um, Keyser, uh, as Comet ceases to be part of the Keyser group, uh, in which event Kill will not be a creditor anymore. Yes. So as I understand it, the argument goes like this. Subsection 5 says you must have the desire to produce the effect in 4. Mm. And 4 says that the relevant effect is the desire to put a creditor in a better position than they otherwise would be in a liquidation. Yeah. And the point that's being made is that there is no world in which Kill would have ended up as a creditor in a liquidation. Yes. Because either there wouldn't be a liquidation or Kill wouldn't be a creditor. Precisely so. And I have three broad answers to that submission. And the first is this. The judge, as I've just shown you, found, as a matter of fact, that Kieser did have a concern that Kill would lose out in a comet insolvency. And there was ample evidential basis for that. I showed you the paper a moment ago contemplating the possibility of Kieser acting as Comet's buying agent post-sale and being exposed to an enhanced risk in the event of Comet bankruptcy down the line. And as I said, although Jarty is justified in submitting that Kieser did not want Comet to go into insolvency, it plainly does not follow that it did not foresee that risk. And the judge made precisely that point in paragraph 2 to 3, which I read out to the court a moment ago. 
But second point, take the analysis a stage further. Assume for discussion that although Kiza did, as her ladyship found, in fact have a concern about kill, suffering a loss in a comet insolvency, but that concern was, in hindsight, ill-founded for the reasons which Dart advances to this court. What follows then? And so far as that's concerned, we suggest that there is some authority that touches on that point, albeit in a slightly different context. And it's a case that you find in volume one of the authorities bundle at tab 15, which is a decision called Hill against the Spread Trustee Fund. This was a case under section 43 of the Insolvency Act, not under 239. What had happened was that a bankrupt had transferred land to a trust as part of a scheme to evade capital gains tax. And his trustee in bankruptcy later bought a 43 claim to unwind that transfer. The bankrupt argued at trial that he couldn't have had the necessary intent, the intent to prejudice or to fraud creditors, in rough paraphrase because the settlement could not, of itself, have evaded capital gains tax. That could only have come about, he said, if HMRC had also accepted an undervaluation of the land as at the date upon which it was settled on trust. The bankrupt lost on that argument at trial but he revived it on appeal. And if you turn on to bundle page 284, you can see how Lady Justice Arden deals with that point at her paragraph 102. Starting at the beginning, the next question is whether a person can be said to have the necessary purpose if he's completely mistaken as to whether entry into the transaction can have the effect of prejudicing a person's interests. This question assumes a rather exceptional state of affairs where a person has the purpose of putting assets beyond the reach of creditors and wrongly thinks if he enters into a transaction at an undervalue, his creditor will be prejudiced. But if you move down just below letter F, there's another passage starting on the right-hand side, another situation that might occur where the debtor enters into a transaction, knowing that his entry into that transaction, together with the happening of some other event, will prejudice a creditor. And then you can see how her ladyship deals with the submission between letters G to H. So the submission is advanced by Miss Newman, Queen's Counsel for the Bankrupt. And she says, I don't accept Miss Newman's submission that it's necessary to approach 43 as if a test of causation were to be applied. The right approach, in my judgment, is to apply the statutory wording. It is enough if the transaction sought to be impugned was entered into with the requisite uh, purpose. So Lady Justice Arden holds that it doesn't matter even if the transaction was entered into under a misapprehension. What matters is the state of the mind which the disponor actually had. We rely on those comments in this rather different context. And they lead on to my third point, which concerns the substantive merits of what is ultimately a construction argument on the part of the Sorry, Can you just say, I'm not sure that I entirely follow Miss Newman's submission as recorded. So she submits it's necessary to approach section 423 as if a test of causation were to be applied. But would, you wouldn't be having recourse to section 243 unless, on the face of it, assets were put beyond, beyond the reach of creditors. Yes. So there is a, there's a bit of a causation point there. What Lady Justice Arden says, well, as long as the transaction was motivated by a desire, 
that's enough. I'm not quite sure what this what what causation test was being suggested. I mean, you you have settled the property; that's happened. The question is, in doing that, did you have a purpose? Um, answer: Yes, you did. The fact that it might have been ineffective for other reasons doesn't matter. The, the submission, as I understand it, is twofold. First of all, the settlement didn't obey CGT at all. So it didn't put... No. The, 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 the submission that was advanced was that the settlement into offshore trusts only evaded UK capital gains tax if the debtor also or the trustees perhaps, doesn't matter, made a misrepresentation about the value of land as at the date of the settlement. But the fact that the land was in the hands of the trustees rather than the bankrupt was the act which was meant to put the asset beyond the reach of creditors. Is that right? That's, I haven't understood that. I'll, I'll read it in my own time, yes. but I, I haven't quite understood what this case the, is. The, reason, the reasoning is a little compressed. But the, the, the only point that I'm getting to is that the decision there is that you simply apply the unfettered statutory yes. wording. And so that comes on to the question of what the state of mind is that suffices for the purposes of a preference. Now, before going back to the section, let me just postulate an example prompted by some suggestions which my Lord and Justice Louis made to Mr. Smith during the course of submissions yesterday. Assume I have a friend called an ex who runs a company which owes me a substantial sum of money. And he tells me he may have to go into liquidation, and if he does, I'm only going to get a fraction of what I'm owed. I'm desperate for cash, so I can't wait for a dividend out of a liquidation, quite apart from anything else. So I go to him and I say, I'm so desperate, if you can't pay me today, I'm going to have to assign my debt tomorrow at a deep discount to realize liquidity. And so he pays me in full, in recognition of his affection for me. On Darcy's submission, that can't be a preference because X doesn't desire to put me in a better position than I would be in if I had to prove in the company's winding up. Because X knows, because I've told him and assume that it's true, that if he doesn't repay me in full, I'm going to assign my debt. We respectfully suggest it is completely unreal to suggest that that sort of factual situation is out with the purview of subsection 239. And in fact, one of the alternatives, which her ladyship specifically referred to here, was the possibility of the kill debt being assigned. And if you're assigning a debt against an insolvent company, you assign at a discount. It may be a very deep discount indeed. That discount is effectively simply a proxy for the loss that you will sustain if you have to prove. So we suggest it cannot possibly be right that there has to be a specific contemplation that the creditor's loss, the preferee's loss, will be occasioned by winding up. And we pray in a two short passages from two authorities that the court has already looked at in aid of that proposition take them very quickly indeed. They're in the same bundle, volume one of the authorities bundle. The first one is the case of Mr. Justice Lloyd's in Wills, which you see if you turn back to tab nine. Bundle page 145. Looking at letter G, where his lordship says it's not necessary, it seems to be, in order to show such a desire to demonstrate that the directors knew that the company would go into an insolvent liquidation, or when it would do so, or therefore that it was necessary that the company should cease trading at some particular time. So I rely on that, 
And then turning back to tab 11, you have the decision in Katz and McNally that we looked at before. Now going to it for a rather different purpose on bundle page 169. between letters A and B at the top, where Lord Justice Peter Gibson says, it isn't necessary to establish that the directors of the company knew or believed that it was insolvent. It's sufficient that they were influenced by the desire to put the creditor into a position which in the event of the company going into insolvent liquidation would be better than if no payment were made. I presume that question has to be judged at the time when yes, the preference was given. Not with the benefit of hindsight. Yes. We, we adopt that reasoning, and can I take you back to the section itself? I take you back. We haven't gone to the section, I think, in the course of my submission so far. So back at tab one, on page eight. So the focus, of course, is on subsection five. Companies shall not make an order unless the company which gave the preference is influenced in deciding to give it by desire to produce in relation to that person the effect. And part of the answer to Darty's point, we suggest, is that all the company has to have in contemplation is the effect. It does not have to have regard also to the means by which that effect is produced, which is what you see in sub 4b. But the effect is putting the person into a position which, in the event of the company going into the solvent liquidation, would be better than he would have been in. It is. It's an, it, is, it is a desire to produce a bettering effect. My Lord Lord Justice Lewis made the point in a case called Hawks Hill. Or what? Hawks Hill. It's Hawks Hill. Yeah. yeah. It's in tab 14 of the bundle. I'm not going to take you to it. That the insolvent liquidation, which is postulated in sub 4b, is a notional insolvent liquidation at the transaction date. Yeah. In, in the event that. Exactly. It's a hypothetical construct. And for the purposes of this provision, that hypothetical construct fulfills two functions. The first is that it tells the court whether or not there has been a preference at all. The second is, if there has, it tells the court what the extent of that preference is, which feeds into the remedial order which the court might make under subsection 3. But it is, we respectfully suggest, wrong to suggest, that because those two things are determined by reference to a notional liquidation postulated by sub 4b, that as at the transaction date, one cannot have desire to prefer if one doesn't have that notional liquidation in mind. Still less if one doesn't have in mind some other actual liquidation at some later date, which the section doesn't even refer to at all. I mean, the, the judge concluded on, on the evidence that there was contemplation of a liquidation. hard is it to envisage how 239 can bite unless the decision maker does have in mind the possibility of a liquidation? Yes. That's an evidential point. So the judge has reached that conclusion. I don't know whether it's evidential or not, but it's hard to conceive of having an intention to put someone in a better position in insolvency unless you have in mind the possibility of insolvency. Yes, but, 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 but what's important for my purpose is the argument that I gave, or the example that I gave, the hypothetical example I gave to you, of the situation where the person making the payment knows perfectly well that the person being paid isn't going to sustain a loss in a winding up. It may be that there may be a winding up, but they may know that the creditor's loss will not be sustained in that way. And on the facts of this case, the proxy for that loss would have been the discount that Kieser would have had to have accepted in relation to its debt. I'm not sure I fundamentally disagree, but just going back to your example, can I understand it? So you owe me money, I need the money, I say, look, unless you pay me, um, uh, I'm going to have to dispose of my um, 
claim a deep discount because you're insolvent? Yes. Um, and do you then pay me? Yes. Well, don't you then have in mind putting me in a better position than I would have been in in, in an insolvent liquidation? Yes, I can see that. I mean, it, um, the only point that I'm trying to get at is that it need not necessarily be the case that the party conferring the preference specifically has in contemplation that the mechanism for your loss will be the insolvency. It could be crystallized earlier in a transaction. And that's the relevant point for my present purposes. Oh, right. is it, does this turn on the, on the phrase that person in subsections four and five? In what sense? Well, Mr. Smith is saying, well, that person is Kill. Kill will not be a creditor in an insolvent liquidation. Therefore, even if somebody succeeds to exactly the same debt by way of assignment, they're a different person. And therefore, the required desire cannot exist. I'm just wondering if there is an interpretation of that person which may go further than the current holder of the debt. Yes. I hadn't considered that point, candidly. Um, but I mean, lots of debts are very freely assignable. Yes. So, and you, uh, indeed, a debtor may not know who his creditor is. Mr. Mr. Smith postulates a world in which Kill will not end up an unsecured creditor in a binding way. Mm. I've made the point that there is contemplation of the possibility of kill yes. ending up. Yes. That's a finding of fact. But even in this transactional world where there's going to be a clearing of the balance, the point that I'm making is that even in that context, the discounting of the debt, the clearing of the balance would of itself be a proxy for the loss that kill would have taken in a binding up. It's no answer to say Kill would never have been a creditor of Comet after it departed Keyes' ownership, because all M&A transactions are predicated on the basis of a clean break. If the consequence of that is that you have to write off your debt or capitalize <coughs> your debt, but instead of that, you take steps to ensure that you are paid, mm. you are preferred. I'm moving on to a different topic. I note the time. Right. Well, shall we stop there and resume at two? Just by way of footnote, um, Hawk Hill was decided in the High Court in Birmingham, not the County Court. I do apologise. Did I say County no, Court? The, the, report, the report says it was the County Court. Oh, really? Court, but it wasn't. <laughs> so I don't apologise, but I'm grateful for the correction. <laughs>